Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome back to the Finding Genius video series. I'm, I'm joined by a good friend, Zach. Uh, we studied together at NYU. Zach, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to be here. Yeah, Zach's a principal with General Catalyst. He started off his career at Emergence Capital. Um, he's actually a former founder of an ed tech startup called Truant Today. He's gone through Techstars. Uh, like I mentioned, we graduated from NYU. So I was hoping we could start there. Um, and I'm actually very honored you agreed to join this podcast because I know you have a, a, a pretty strong aversion towards podcasts, thinking that they're really bad. Um, and I know you started rethinking that when you joined Alexis with non-technical. So hopefully this one uh, continues on the same trend. You know, I, I told Alexis there's only been one good podcast episode. That was my episode of her podcast. But I, I have a really good <laughs> feeling this could be the second good podcast episode in history. Just fingers crossed. Yeah, we got we got 30 minutes to see if we can make that happen. Yeah, exactly. But I think before we go into your background and your history and kind of some of the stuff that we worked on together and, and the path through emergence and general catalyst, I think what would be interesting also is just to frame it and to start it in terms of what are you most excited about these days? And what do you believe is the most overhyped areas? And you're very vocal on Twitter, um, which anybody that knows you would probably follow it well. But I mean, if you want to start with Dogecoin, if you want to start with NFTs, if you want to start with uh, yeah. you know, healthcare, I think it'll just be interesting to hear some just general thoughts of where you're spending your time. I mean, listen, there, there's clearly a lot of areas today that are overhyped. Um, I think it's it's broadly uncontroversial to point out that we are uh, in at least an inflationary adjacent moment, if not an, infla an inflationary moment right now. And so I, I even saw it today, right? People was comparing uh, the NFT crash to the dot-com bubble bursting, right? So there, there's clearly something happening. Um, what am I most excited about? It's, it's challenging, actually, because one of the areas I'm most excited about is also one of the areas that I think is perhaps the most hyperinflated today, which is sort of a, a strange dichotomy to live in. Um, you know, I spend a lot of time thinking about developer tools. I just did the, the Series A for a company called Gitpod based in Germany um, that I'm very, very excited about. The, I think, perhaps obvious thing to point out here is that even as my enthusiasm continues to grow for developer tools, and even as it is obvious, I think, to many people that the market for developer tools is only growing over time, um, because it's obvious to so many people, the prices and rounds of these developer tool companies are happening earlier and earlier at higher and higher prices. And so there's a, a strange moment where I both feel there's a tremendous amount of growth that has yet to happen in developer tools, but gosh, you really have to believe that because you're paying for that growth today the market's growth, rather, to be clear, um, ahead of many of the indicators that you would typically look for, uh, you know, of a round of this size. I mean, the companies that have one or two design partners are going out and raising $30 million Series Bs, right? So it's a very different world, certainly a different world than 10 years ago when I started my company, and even more a different world, shockingly, than, you know, three or four years ago when I was at Emergence, right? It's just completely, completely changed there. Um, I think there's a lot of low-hanging fruit you teed up for me in terms of other areas. I think are overinflated, but it's not fun that I'm going to talk about, you know, yeah, sure. and talk about like I, I could say the same three things everyone feels about those spaces. Yeah. But I think we all would agree, or I hope we all would agree, that a lot of the there's a lot of perhaps, uh, you know, there's there's a lot of cash printed money, right? Money printer uh, cash rather flowing into a lot of areas that maybe the fundamentals don't quite align with. And how are you? I guess again before we go back, but. Since you haven't, your start was 10 years ago, as you mentioned, yeah, and you awesome. haven't been through that correction per se, no. how are you rationalizing it with developer tools and especially in the conversations, and I haven't been through a correction either, in conversations with your partnership at General Catalyst or Emergence when maybe they've seen it, um, yeah. they've seen these valuations and you're pounding your fist on the table and saying, this is a company that we believe we should invest in no matter what the valuation is. How do you rationalize you know it's so hard because the, just to zoom out for a second, like the challenge in venture and call it like mid career venture, early career venture, whatever you, whatever you want to say, like the challenge of, of junior venture broadly is you have no idea if you're any good at the job, right? Like you, until you have cash on, no, I mean, this is the truth. Until you have cash on cash returns, it is very hard to know if you're good. And, and really I would argue until you go successfully through a correction, it's really hard to know you're good, right? At this point, I wouldn't say everyone is, 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 you know, seeing markups in venture, but it, it's probably easier today than it ever has been to see a great markup in venture. Um, and so the, the first challenge is like, even if there are things you're excited about, there's always, or at least in my case, there's the overhanging question of like, 
is my taste really that good or am I just living or, or was I just lucky enough to live through a moment when the money printer is flowing? There's more dollars seeking more venture opportunities than ever. And as a result, many of these companies are getting marked up and doing quite well. That's sort of the first thing. Um, the challenge on, I think the, the challenge, but also the way to succeed, I think for many of these, you know, pounding the fist moments is to think about things thematically. I think the, the challenge of being opportunistic, the advantage rather of being opportunistic is it gives you insight and opportunity to do a lot of investments in a lot of different areas. The challenge of being opportunistic is I at least like to see the index and opportunities and think about what are the other things that are available? How is it doing in benchmark in comparison to the rest of those? Where is this market moving to, right? And these are all the questions that I think I want to have an answer to before I go and pound the table for an investment that I feel really convicted about. If you're not thematic, you're sort of scrambling to do this work in real time in a process that, again, 10 years ago might have been a month, five years ago might have been two weeks, today might be 48 hours, right, if that. Um, where, you know, at least for, for hot businesses, right? Uh, and so if you're thematic, you have the advantage of a, of a prepared mind, the advantage of a point of view on the space, the advantage, hopefully, of educating your partners already or helping your partners reach conviction on where a market is moving to. If you are opportunistic, you're doing those things in real time. So the, the answer is, in many respects, be thematic, go deep, have that point of view before you go out. And that way, it doesn't mean you only can do things that come from that thematic landscape of the world, but it means when an opportunistic thing does come into you, you've done the homework to have the index and have the prepared mind to succeed and to pound the table really hard when the right one comes around. And what's your, I mean, I, I, I guess that's an interesting question is what are your strategies to become smart on the space? Since, yeah. not, I mean, you specialize a little bit in ed tech, but you've been a venture venture capitalist since the beginning of your career. Similarly as well, I haven't built any specializations, um, but going, like Montenegro has a deep healthcare focus. Yep. But when you're yep. looking at developer tools, you're looking at something completely different. Where yep. do you, how do you get smart on the space fast enough so when a founder who's been spending the last decade on it is now, uh, respects your opinion on the space as well? Well, by the way, so uh, it's funny, you know, I started my career in ed tech. I haven't actually done ed tech in a while uh, as an investor, right? So it's even to your point earlier, you know, I spend most of my time now probably in, in SaaS, vertical SaaS, prosumer productivity, developer tools, where I spend, you know, a lot of my, my day in, day out. Um, although ed tech is always a passion of mine and, you know, was very, very close to it for a long time. Um, I, let's be honest, right? It'd be hubris, it would be hubristic of me to come into a founder who has spent 10 years as, as a CTO, et cetera, et cetera, and say, I've spent six months thinking about this. I've spent two years thinking about this, spent three years, whatever the case might be. And I'm now an expert and you ought to listen to me and take my advice, right? That would be, I, I think, you know, the lack of self-awareness on display would be just galling. Um, but it doesn't mean that you can't look at things and have a point of view and perhaps uncover something that's a new idea or even articulate an idea that is uh, that, that exists, but perhaps intellectualize it in a new way. Um, and so a lot of the, you know, when I think about becoming an expert in new space, I think about it in two ways. One, it's can I just get up to speed, right? It doesn't mean I have to uncover anything new, but can I talk to as many experts as I can? That's how at least I, I tend to learn. And then can I, I, you know, I, I almost like to go and call it like a book spiral, right? So you start with something that's a, a popular sort of well-known book and you kind of go deeper into the next level of things that references, and maybe there's an index or a footnote in there that references something else. And so eventually you find yourself kind of crawling through this maze of, of increasingly, uh, you know, more arcane or increasingly less common uh, books that are out of print. We got to find the ebook from somewhere or whatever. And eventually you uncover sort of the history of a space and you start to put together um, historic understanding. Does, does it rival that of having been there for 20 years? No, but you know, I'm, I'm 26. So there's only so much you can do without being 56, right? Um, so, so step one is, is can you assemble the right group of experts, have the right conversations, but more importantly, do your own homework uh, in terms of the sort of idea maze of blogs and, and books and what the case might be. So you actually can make use of the experts whose time you've sort of generously or, or they've generously lent to you. So that's, that's getting up to speed. Then there's thinking about where are the gaps or where are the opportunities? And that requires a little bit of the thematic thinking, right? It's putting together what is the framework or the landscape on the space that you understand. And I'm, I'm a visual thinker, so for me, it's oftentimes literally putting together a, an actual physical map. But for other folks, it might be a memo, it might be whatever the case, whatever you're comfortable creating and, and however your ideas take thought, it's putting together the encapsulated form of ideas and trying to understand 
where is their white space or, or what are, or a question I like to ask myself, you know, I'm sure you've heard the phrase, history doesn't repeat, but it rhymes, right? And so it's, what are the repeated, repetitive narratives that have happened over the last 15, 20 years? And what narrative seems like it might recur today as well? And so when you go through the exercise of white spaces and repetition, eventually I think you start to understand here are opportunities or here are open areas where you could make an investment or you could find a great company uh, that exists there, or at least have a point of view on here's where the market may move, not out of any real expertise, but any, you know, out of having an understanding perhaps uh, of the pattern uh, of, of the last 15, 20 years. That, does that uncover everything? No, I mean, what you'll find almost definitionally is that it won't uncover things that are truly novel. And for that, that requires talking to folks and having relationships with folks who are really building things that are brand new and never seen before. But I think that does do a nice job getting up to speed on call it 70, 75% of things that come in through the door or that you might see that maybe are less than truly novel, but are really riffs on or remixes of previous ideas. Mm -hmm. um, but again, you know, ultimately, I think a lot of the job is, is being comfortable, or at least my, the way I do the job, a lot of the job is being comfortable saying, I don't know, or I want to ask a question, and having the, you know, hopefully the confidence in yourself to be able to not be the smartest guy in the room, and, and if you're doing the job right, never be the smartest guy in the room. Right, right. And I guess that's a theme that I want to focus more on in terms of your process of learning. So going back to NYU, you studied at Gallatin, correct? Yes. Yeah. So Gallatin is known to have a less structured curriculum than other institutions, than, and it's much more develop your own curriculum, develop your own major. And do, would you credit that of kind of your ability to learn in those processes and that unstructured nature format to your ability as a VC? Or can you talk a little bit about that yeah. and where your interest in venture and technology started to take shape or what you were actually studying at that point? And then I want yeah. to get into the learnings of you've worked with the best investors at Emergence, you've worked with the best investors at General Catalyst. So it's I've been very, very lucky to learn from a lot of good people. Um, okay, so zooming, so going back all the way to the beginning, you know, I was raised in a very academic household. Uh, my mom is a, a, a was a psychologist for a long time, no longer practices. Uh, my dad was a college professor, right? So in many respects, this was a house where you know every night we would have dinner all together. Uh, we would talk a lot about a lot of different things. I was joking with somebody else recently, you know, it was like being in the Thunderdome in a lot of ways, right? Like there was a sense of, if you had an idea, you better be ready to explain it or at least defend it. And you gotta be comfortable fighting for airtime. I think what that creates, by the way, is an interest, or, or at least created me, was an interest and a hunger and an appetite to go through and learn a lot about a lot. It doesn't always work, doesn't always mean you're correct about those things, but at least have a point of view on certain things that you then learn is strongly, uh, what is it, uh, strong opinions weekly held, right? You learn is, is fairly fixed uh, or fairly malleable rather, um, but at least confident enough to send as a trial balloon. So in many respects, I think Gallatin was an evolution of that, right? It's, it's being raised in that sort of household and I attribute a lot of that to, to my folks who are, I think were phenomenal parents. Um, and then going to Gallatin and getting to, uh, you know, to, to undergrad, it was interesting. You know, I really liked the ability to put together things that were interdisciplinary. And it's funny, when I talk about General Catalyst now, one of the things that I always talk about is how often we invest at the intersection of disciplines, right? How often we invest, I, I usually say the intersection of silos. You know, we think about, can we do a, you know, are we going to go out and, and do a deal that is at the intersection of, uh, you know, of, of bottoms up sort of traditional consumer distribution and the classic top-down enterprise sales motion. I call that the, the enterprise pincer movement, right? Can you have the, the bottoms-up usage that really gets you distribution, but also have the really good top-down key account process that gets you revenue and actually gets you to the point of being a, a, you know, a sustainable public business? Um, so in a lot of respects, I, you know, it's, it's sort of a natural fit at GC because they're interdisciplinary thinkers, and I come from, I like to think at least, an interdisciplinary background. Um, can but you give it, us, I, sorry, I, I, before, sorry, since you just mentioned, can you give us some examples of those silos and some of GC's companies that fit well within that theme? Yeah, yeah, I mean, listen, you might think about like 10 years ago when, when I did my startup, um, folks traditionally built in silos, right? You were consumer or you were enterprise or you sold top down or you sold bottoms up or you were uh, a marketplace or you were software or you were uh, infrastructure or you were an application, right? And these were... They weren't completely fixed, but they were fairly, uh, just, you know, fairly separate silos. And so you built in one of them and you built a great company in one of them. I think the lesson that we have learned or that we're still thinking about is that many of the most interesting companies of the next five to 10 years 
are built at the intersection of those silos, and, and more to the point, they're built in a world where many of these silos just stop existing, right? And so oftentimes, what we think about is, you know, when we find, you know, we find a company, and you can go through, I can, I can talk through the portfolio, but when you find a company that is at the intersection of these two things, right? We've seen a ton of these vertical marketplaces, and a lot of the vertical marketplaces, the way that they actually continue to build value is by adding SaaS-like offerings over time. Um, and so you find ultimately the way that a lot of these companies are operationalizing themselves is by starting to bridge out across the, the different silos. Now, the, listen, the truth is, of course, I'm talking my own book, right? In so many respects, it's, it's nice to be a generalist fund saying the world is getting more generalist, right? That's certainly, uh, you know, certainly got to examine the source of where that's coming from. Um, but I think we've seen that to, to genuinely be the case. I mean, even if you look at you know, look at all of the classic uh, PLG companies or all of the classic sort of, with, with the exception of like Atlassian, all of the classic sort of uh, developer tools or all of the classic bottoms up growth companies. And what you'll find is, is that pincer motion I was talking about earlier, right? The combination of bottoms up to get distribution and top down to maximize value of key accounts. And what you see is you, if you go through and look at the S1s of these businesses, that is how they often scale. They scale by doing both of these things um, at once. And that's the, you know, that's the, and, and between that or whether it's building a marketplace with SaaS on top of it, like these are the things that we see kind of the, back to the, the earlier point about history isn't repeat, but it rhymes. Like these are the same sort of, um, same sort of patterns that I'm seeing in the last couple of years emerge more and more strongly to the point that I'm confident saying we want to go out and explicitly try to find, you know, a lot of these, these intersections. I mean, to be clear, if you look at our entire healthcare portfolio, right. everything that we're doing in healthcare, is effectively either healthcare and consumer, right? Which requires in many respects, having the DNA of really good payer relationships and also the DNA of really strong consumer marketing, which are two very different silos together, um, or it's healthcare enterprise, which requires the ability to sell into large enterprises, but also have the scientific background to really maximize the care value of what you're providing. Um, and so it's, it's, you know, the reason I'm, I'm not naming individual companies, it's basically the entire portfolio. I mean, I would yeah. say at this point, it's more companies than not that fit into these buckets. That's very interesting. And so you were talking about Gallatin and you're talking about, so tell me about how your, your venture career has evolved from when you were searching for investments in Dorman Fund. And yeah, then yeah. Emergence Capital, they've become kind of the most reputable enterprise venture fund in Box, Salesforce, Zoom. What's some of those metrics and how you were learning on how to evaluate an enterprise business to now what you're talking about with Silo as a general catalyst? Could you just to walk us through some of those progressions or some of the missteps or the failures you had or some of the investment yeah. theories that you thought about that you thought would be interesting? Um, and at the same time, I guess it, you've built a brand for yourself as a good investor, but then also through Twitter. I think talk about how you've invested in that as a, as a medium through all those, those, those pieces. Yeah. Well, you gave me like a real question and you teed up a softball. So I'm going to go with the softball. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'll take the easier of the two. Gotta make it entertaining as well. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, you know, it's funny. I, I think about, uh, one of the things I, I like to say a lot is that personality is a competitive advantage. Like in, in a world where there's a tremendous amount of capital. Um, and where entrepreneurs have their pick of who they can work with. Um, two of the things that, that often occur to me, and this is part from my own time as a founder and part just things I've seen repeatedly you know, across all those places, right? Is that founders want to feel like the person they're working with, their board member or the, the lead investor, the person across the table from them is a real person who they can rely on. They can call up at 2 a.m. and say a customer churned or employee is leaving or whatever the case might be and feel like they can really get support from. Um, and part of that is from experience, right? Which just comes with time and a number of reps you put in in your time on boards. And part of that comes from personality, right? Do you have a cultural fit or cultural match with, um, with the founders you talk to? Did you ever read the old OkCupid data science blog? I don't know if you, if you ever were a I fan of it. No. So I, I read this years and years ago and it's like stuck with me. And by the way, this was literally probably eight, nine years ago. So I'm sure I'm going to get this wrong for somebody who listens and used to work at OkCupid to correct me. Um, but effectively there was some like study they'd done at OkCupid. And what they found was that the people who had the most enthusiasm on the site, by which I mean, you know, most inbound messages, most enthusiastic messages, most dates, it wasn't somebody who, you know, on a, on a look scale of one to 10 was universally, you know, considered a seven, right? 
It was somebody who half the people on the site said was a one or a two, and the other half said was a, a nine or a 10, right? And so it's, it's something that's perhaps obvious, but has always stuck with me, which is it's more about finding who are the tribe of people for whom you are particularly resonant, rather than thinking about how can I be all things to all people, or perhaps a, you know, a more milk toast um, sort of approach to, to building, you know, building a brand or, or, or even just being yourself. You know. So when you're humanizing the VC experience, I guess, to talk about from a founder's perspective, what was your process of thinking about it? Who were your tribes that you were working with? Because you were inside. I would, love, I would love to tell you it was this super strategic thing and I was so thoughtful about it. But but it, in, in many respects, it's like an audience of one, right? It's like thinking to myself, what would I would have liked to have read when I was a founder? Um, and, you know, and particularly in, in you know, in venture which skews older, skews uh, you know more conservative in, in some respects. Certainly not at GC or emergence, but just as a, sort of as an industry. Right, 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 right. It is so hard, I think, for founders to find that that really great culture match, um, especially if they if they want to couple that with a firm that has sort of a really great bench of experience. That uh, you know what I found was just being a human who was a normal person on Twitter and could make jokes and could say dumb things, walk them back, like it just. Treating Twitter like you're joking around with your friends, like you're building a, a relationship with the real people and not that you're trying to prove, look at me, look how smart I am, I'm so thoughtful, et cetera, et cetera. It ended up paying real dividends. And once I realized that, certainly I doubled down, but it wasn't as though I said to myself, let me go and figure out what's the right platform to build a brand on. I, I thought to myself when I'm on Twitter, you know, what's the kind of thing that I would enjoy reading? And, and that luckily in this case turned out to be a you know, right. fairly su successful strategy. But now before we get to the hardball, yeah, yeah. The so so the last I don't know how many years it's been going on, but at least over a decade, venture funds have been investing in platform, and that's the piece yep. that I write about in my book. Also, about I spoke with several platform experts and how they're thinking about it. But now, platform has become Zach, who got, is building his own platform, and he's an investor that I mean, he belongs. To, he works with General Catalyst right now, but his platform is also elevated. Where now, and the founders would want to work with him directly. Do you think the way we're seeing writers go to Substack away from New York Times because they have their own personalities, do you think that's starting to happen in venture as well, where the investor is now elevated above the brand of just the venture fund? I mean, listen, I, I think there's a balance, right? There's always a tension between front of the jersey, back of the jersey, to, to use a metaphor I'm sure I'm stealing from somebody else. Um, the truth is that if you think about personality as a competitive advantage, the, the thing that goes part and parcel with that is that the failure mode is to be what I call a commodity player. And a commodity player is something who I think about. That's somebody who you could swap in or out of two or three firms. You wouldn't really notice them being gone. You wouldn't notice the addition of them. That could be on personality. It could be on insight. There's a lot of vectors by which you can distinguish yourself. But if you don't distinguish yourself on any of them, you're a commodity. And the challenge is that in a world where everybody has a platform, if all you do is say we're a platform as a fund, but we have no individuals and you kind of wash your hands of it, um, you know, effectively, you've turned your firm into a bunch of commodity players. I mean, think about for a second the enterprise value of a venture fund. Right? There, there really is not much enterprise value outside of the the partners themselves, the, the investors themselves. Obviously, I think firms over time want to want to get to a place where there's much more than that. But that's why so many firms struggle with generational transition. That's why so many firms struggle with with hiring and retaining talent. I mean, ultimately, for better or for worse, I think it's a star driven industry. A star doesn't mean you have to be on Twitter every day and you have to have a million followers, but a star means you have to have an individual brand that, that complements that of right. the brand of the firm that you're a part of. And if you don't have you know, a really strong back of Jersey, it's hard to build into a very strong or maintain a very strong front of Jersey. That's sort of the, the challenge. So do I think the, the world is moving towards you know, the, the sub stackification where everyone's a solo GP and firms go away? Probably not. I think there are some folks who can do a great job of that, and and you know, but it's probably less than you know fifty percent of people in venture today, and that's not a bad thing. I think it's just point of fact. Most folks do better on a team than they would do, you know, totally eating what they kill by themselves. Right. Um, commensurately, though, I think the value of the back of jersey individual has certainly gone up, right? Especially in, in, again in this world of commodity players, where you have to have a firm that has individual stars. Otherwise you're a firm that nobody knows. Interesting. And I guess since we're running up on time now with the, oh. with the hardball side, but I think this was very interesting. The, the, maybe if we just focus it a bit more with some of the partners that you've worked with emergence and general catalyst, what are those takeaways that 
you've learned about how you evaluate business or some of those memorable moments in terms of for investors everywhere who maybe aren't getting the same sort of exposure since this is a kind of a mentorship driven business. What are yeah. some of the lessons or those moments that stick out to you? You know, it's interesting. Um, oftentimes at, at you know, the earliest stages, now I'm doing so much more seed and I'm doing so much more, you know, early series A stuff, right? Um, you know, the earliest stages, people always talk about looking for the right founder. And that's true. You have to have sort of the founder problem fit is how I think about the, the question, right? Is there some unfair, unique advantage these founders have? But I think ultimately, uh, the thing that I that I have learned and been told to look for and have sort of internalized myself is a founder who has a deep understanding of of how difficult it is to build a truly iconic public business. And that's like ultimately think about like returning a fund for a second. There are plenty of uh, good products and there are plenty of good point solutions and there are plenty of founders who are great you know in the early stages and certainly many investors who are great in the early stages. It is rare and really hard to be the kind of person who can grow into an Eric of Zoom or grow into, you know, a Patrick or John of Stripe. Like th those are, it's, it's a, and it requires, and nobody is certainly born that way, right? But it requires a really aggressive growth mindset to continue to be able to develop over time. And so in the earliest stages, yeah, you're looking for the unfair advantage. You're looking for the founder problem fit. And certainly at series A, you're looking for the net dollar retention. And do they have a sense of what the upsell looks like and the pincer motion? And, you know, I, I could sit here and sort of, list out for you 30 metrics, but the the singular thing that I am looking for always is what is the rate of growth and the rate of change in these founders? Because if you see somebody who has a really high rate of growth and change, ultimately that gives me confidence and conviction this person can grow into the CEO of an iconic public business. Doesn't mean the business is there, but but ultimately that's the but ultimately you need to have that prerequisite to kind of grow. Um and so that's that's the hardest thing to find. It requires really building a relationship with a founder. It's not, you can't do it in what I call a, a shotgun financing, like a shotgun wedding where you meet somebody and 24 hours later, you're walking down the altar with them. Um, but if you build a real relationship and you get to know founders over time and you really go deep with folks, then you can truly understand, is that the way they look at things? Is that the way they're really setting themselves up to be a leader? Great. Zach, thank you so much. This was very helpful. Yeah, I thanks for having me. Uh, Alexis's podcast. <laughs> well, thanks for having me. It was a lot of fun. Uh, certainly more more buzzwords than Alexis's podcast and less <laughs> heritage. Good, but good. that's okay. That's all right. Yeah, right. Thanks, Zach. I appreciate it. Thank you.